All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you today. My name is Justin, and I'm one of the pastors here at Aletheia. Uh, It's Baptism Sunday, which is always so exciting, and I know that many of you have come out to celebrate with your friends who are being baptized, and it is a means, it's a perfect opportunity for celebration because of what we're doing here this morning. Now, before we get to the baptisms, we have been in a teaching series in the book of Philippians entitled Invincible Joy. And the reason it has this title is because this theme of joy shows up throughout the book. It's all over the place. Paul is constantly talking about how he's filled with joy. He's, he's rejoicing. He's so happy. But the great irony of the letter is that he's sitting in prison. I don't know about you. If I were in prison, joy would be probably the farthest thing from my mind. But in the letter, we actually see Paul's reasons for being so joyful. So we're looking into those and finding out how, through the good news about Jesus, we can have the same kind of invincible joy. So we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. You can go ahead and open a Bible or a Bible app to Philippians 2. And we're going to begin in verse 12 and read through the end of the chapter. So that's Philippians 2, verse 12 through 30. If you're following along in a Bible app, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. So if you select that translation, you'll be able to follow along word for word. Also feel free to follow up on the screen. I'm going to read for us, I'll pray, and then we'll get stuck in. Verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. With fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad, and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, and he's been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that he would guide us in it today. Heavenly Father, invincible joy is something that we want. So our prayer is that you would lead and guide us in your scriptures that are true, that are trustworthy, that are pure, that we can rely upon. And would you show us what it looks like to share in this salvation that you've given us by grace through Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We finished off last week, and Pastor Quentin kind of read over this very famous passage where Paul, in this kind of exultant moment, is describing Jesus' position. He says that Jesus has been raised from the dead. He was so humble, but now God has given him the name that is above every other name. Like, there's nobody more important, with more authority, in higher status or acclaim than Jesus. And now in this passage, he's going to give us the big therefore. 
And what might you expect? What might you expect? Okay, so Jesus is higher than you can possibly even imagine. Therefore, well, here's what Paul says. Therefore, work. Specifically, he says, therefore, work out your salvation. Now, this is kind of strange, and immediately, this is actually a pretty controversial verse, because the big claim about the Christian faith is that you don't work for your salvation, that it's something you receive as a free gift. Well, notice, he doesn't say work for your salvation. He says work out your salvation. So Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that salvation is a gift given by sheer grace that you receive by faith. But apparently that's not the finish line. That's just the starting point. And now Paul says, work out your salvation. What does he have in mind? Well, earlier in the chapter, he's telling them to be unified, to assess their own motives, and to seek the interests of others. So those are the activities that he has in mind. But think about this phrase, work out your salvation. By obeying, they are actually experiencing the salvation life that Jesus has procured for them. As I was thinking about this passage, my grandmother came to mind. She passed away earlier this year in her late 80s. But she is a woman who worked out her salvation every single day. Whenever I had FaceTime with her, She was always telling me about what God was teaching her, about how God was challenging her. And this is a lady who can barely walk, like her knees were so messed up that she could barely get off the couch, but she's getting off the couch so that she can go and lead a prayer meeting at her church. Why? She's working out her salvation. She knows that God has salvation realities that he wants to bring her into, even at age 88. And she wants to go and get those. Why doesn't everybody live like that is the question. Why doesn't everybody go after salvation like that? It's because it's costly. But what Paul shows us in this passage is why it's worth it. And we're going to see that working out your salvation is worth it. And it brings joy because it brings with it four things. A better fear. A better will. A better goal and a better life. A better fear, a better will, a better goal, and a better life. First, a better fear. He says, work out your salvation, this is in verse 12, with fear and trembling. This is strange. (laughs) Can we acknowledge this? Okay. When I think of being joyful, I don't picture myself trembling and being scared. What is he talking about? Well, he wants the Philippians to be scared of the right thing. And specifically, he wants them to have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is throughout the entire scriptures. It's it's this huge theme. Like the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's how you live a good life. The fear of the Lord is necessary for salvation. The fear of the Lord. And being afraid of the Lord, as strange as that sounds, is a really, really good thing. Let me give you two illustrations. One's a little on the nose, and the second kind of captures the nuance of why it's good to fear the right thing. Say you're walking down the sidewalk, and there's a bug in the sidewalk, and it's like one of those bugs that just scares you. One of those bugs that my wife has a very specific scream for, that when I hear that scream, I know, oh, there's a bug somewhere in the house. So you have the option to jump out of the way. But if you jump out of the way, you jump into a street and there's an oncoming school bus. My hope in that situation is that you would be scared of the right thing. Be more scared of the school bus than of the bug. Now, in a very real way, when it comes to fearing the Lord, that captures the idea. Jesus, in his usual, brilliant, concise fashion, says it like this. This is Matthew 10, verse 28. He says, don't fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Okay, so he's speaking to his disciples, and he says, if you're going to faithfully follow me, some people might even land up killing you, which was true. Many of his disciples died for their faith. But look at what he says. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. 
That's Jesus. I don't usually see people post this on their Facebook feed (laughs) or tattoo this on their arm, right? (laughs) Fear the Lord who will destroy you in hell by fire. (laughs) And yet, that's precisely what he's saying. He's saying, look, you, you can be afraid of the wrong thing, and by being afraid of the wrong thing, you can put yourself at odds with, on a collision course with, the God of the universe. Now, that might put the fear of the Lord into us, and I think that's really good. But let's not stop there. Let's kind of lean into the nuance, why it's a really good thing to fear the Lord. Here's a second image. So forget about the school bus and the bug, and now think about you being a paralegal on a major case, and, and what's involved is like organized crime. So you're working on this case, and you're part of either the defense or the, or the opposition, somebody who's more you know, versed in this realm could probably tell me the right words for it. But say the team that you're a part of is going after the injustice, working against the injustice, and you get a threat. You get a threat from somebody that you either need to remove some evidence or you need to work against this case in order to, to make it easier for your opposition. Now, that's a little bit frightening. That's a little bit frightening that you could be physically harmed or reputationally harmed. You could lose your job because somebody feels like they have the power to do it. But if you choose to, say, take that bribe or you choose to respond to that threat, what you're doing is you're setting yourself at odds with justice. You're actually placing yourself in the camp that is... You know, say, say part of the case is a very, a, a fearless judge who won't be scared into giving a wrong verdict, who won't be afraid of calling out crime. Say you're part of a team with, with an attorney who just like does not care. They're like, I'm here for justice. I'm here to, to see that the truth comes out. If you take that bribe, you put yourself against them and you actually work against justice. Now, God is the judge of all the earth, and he is very intent and very, yeah, he, he, is, he fully plans on putting the world right, on doing justice and bringing righteousness to, to uh, pervade across the earth. If we put ourselves at odds with him, we are putting ourselves at odds with something that is sure to come to pass. The scriptures say God will have his will done in the earth. And for us to be more afraid of being at odds with the judge of all the universe is a really good thing. And in order for them to work out their salvation, they need this better fear. What might the Philippians face? They might lose their jobs. They might be physically harmed. They might be excluded from their families. What might you face if you're going to be a follower of Jesus? who works out your salvation. Maybe some similar things. Maybe not as intense, but still. What might your classmates think? How might your family treat you? How might your colleagues at work treat you? We need a better fear if we're going to work out our salvation. Second, a better will. A better will. Look at verse 13. So he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So get this. He says, Jesus has the name above all names, therefore work, because it's God who works in you. Who's working? Is, are, are you working or is God working? Yes. Yeah. God is doing a work that makes it possible for you to work. Now, what is he doing specifically? says he is working in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Part of every, there, there, there's two components of every action that you take, a will and a work, or a desire and an effect. For example, if I want a sandwich, a couple things have to happen. First, I need to desire a sandwich, which I do often. But then I need to have the energy to get up off the couch and go make myself a sandwich. Will 
work. Now, why is this really good news? If Jesus has called you to work out your salvation, there are some things you are not going to want to do. In and of yourself. Here's an example. Earlier in chapter 2, he tells them to be unified. He says, I want you to be of the same heart, the same mind. I want you to be unified. I don't want like uh, di division and infighting and backbiting and grumbling. I want you to be unified. An essential part of being unified is reconciliation. Because this might be news to you, but like people are part of churches. People. And you know what? People are not perfect. <laughs> you know this. You're one of these. Okay? So if you are going to be unified in a church, it's going to require reconciliation. You know, when somebody does me wrong, sometimes the last thing I want to do is go and reconcile with them. Left to myself, I do not want to go and have that hard conversation. Now, I might want to go and tell them, you know, give them a piece of my mind. I might want to go and cancel them, expose them. But to go and seek reconciliation, to say a hard truth in love, in and of myself, in and of ourselves, we don't desire that. But thanks be to God, who's working in us, both to will and to work for our good pleasure. He tells them, be unified. That's going to take God working and willing in you. He says, don't do anything from selfish ambition. Hey, that is going to be a work of God. He says, look to the interests of others. Boy, oh boy, is that going to need to be a work of God in my life. When I look back on my life, if there were a documentary to be made in my younger years, it could be titled, He Looked to His Own Interests. Like, that's just like all I see. Thanks be to God. It's Him who works and wills in you. And that means that in order to work out your salvation, it's a participation with what He's already doing inside of you. A better will. Third, a better goal. A better goal. The verses where he starts explicitly speaking about joy is verse 17 and 18. And he says this, Even if I am to be poured out as a sacrificial offering on the sacrifice of your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice. Now what is he talking about here? What is this drink offering kind of business? Well, we can kind of Yes, from the fact that he's being poured out, he's referring to his own suffering. And his life is one that has been poured out. He's in prison. He has suffered. He's been shipwrecked. His working out of his salvation in benefit to the Philippians has been very costly, right? But it's more specific. What is a drink offering? <laughs> and this comes from the Mosaic Covenant. You can read about this in Numbers chapter 15. In Numbers 15... Instructions are given for how to do a sacrificial offering. And here's what it says. In all of the non-sin-related sacrifices, there are two components. And it's very important that these are the non-sin-related sacrifices. We'll come back to, that in a, back, back to that in a second. There were two components. A person would bring an animal to be the burnt sacrifice. And then along with it, they would bring like a couple of gallons of wine. And we're, we're not sure if like, it would pour over or alongside, but the goal was always the same. Time and again in Numbers chapter 15, it says, to create a pleasing aroma to the Lord. This sacrifice was designed for a good smell, and it would please the Lord. So what is he saying? He's saying what they're doing is supposed to create a good smell. I love to cook. One of my favorite smells in the kitchen is deglazing a pan with wine. Have you ever smelled that? It's amazing. You cook off the meat, you, co you cook off the vegetables, and then you deglaze it with wine. Without fail, that's the moment when my kids run downstairs and ask, what's cooking in the kitchen? Because it smells so good. That's the point of a sacrificial offering along with a drink offering. It creates this pleasing aroma. Paul says, look, I know what you're doing is costly. I know it costs you something to send Epaphroditus to me. I know it costs you to be a follower of Jesus. I know it's not easy. I know it's uncomfortable. I know some of you have lost your jobs. You've lost friendships. You've lost maybe family inclusion over this. 
But what's happening is that it's creating a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It pleases Him. How do you know? So the, the better goal of working out your salvation then is to please the Lord. If you had to sum up the goal of the Christian life, it could be summed up in that phrase, to please the Lord. How do you know what, the goal, what, what your goal in life is? I think you can use this phrase to figure out. Paul kind of gives us a diagnostic tool here. He says in verse 17, even if, and then he describes his suffering. If you want to find out what the goal of your life is, just fill in the blank after that phrase, even if. Because that's where you figure out what you're willing to sacrifice in order to get what you want. Even if this costs me, even if I have to move, even if it's expensive, even if I get hurt, and then whatever follows, that's what your goal in life is. So here's my question for you. As you overlay this rubric on your life, if you're a follower of Jesus, can you say that? Even if God calls me into discomfort, I'll go. Even if it hurts, even even if my reputation gets a knock, it's worth it. Even if he calls, even if he changes my career plans, even if it's costly, even if he calls me to be way more generous than I ever expected, even if he calls me to move, even if he calls me to something that that, that I don't want to do, even if it's worth it. That's how you figure out what your goal in life is. But here's the thing. That pleasing God is never going to be your goal by just trying harder. My goal in this sermon is not to make you walk out of these doors and say, oh, I really need to try to please God. I must, I must try to please God. I must, I must, I must. Because here's the thing. The people you love most in the world are the people who it's no problem to, to sacrifice for. It is easy to sacrifice for the joy of people you love dearly in this life. Isn't it true? Like for me, to sacrifice to bring joy to my wife and my kids. Yeah, absolutely, of course. To sacrifice to bring joy to dear friends, definitely. And here's the funny thing. If I don't feel that joy, there's something wrong in my soul. But when it comes to pleasing God, we will please Him when we love Him. Because that's just what you do. You know this about yourself. People that you care so deeply for, you sacrifice for. Because their joy becomes your joy. You're happy when you see that they're happy. And Paul says, I want the being above all else whom you aim to please to be God. How do you come to the point of wanting it to be the goal of your life to please God? It's when it hits your heart, the extent to which he has gone to bring you joy. The sacrifice that he has made in order to bring you joy. The scriptures say that when Jesus Christ came into the world, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What joy was that? It was you. It was you. It was the opportunity for sinful human beings, broken human beings, to have relationship with, fellowship with, the perfect holy God of the universe. That was the joy that made Jesus say, even if I have to go to the cross, even if I have to wear a crown of thorns, even if they pierce my side, even if I am rejected and spit upon, even if it costs me my life for the joy set before me, I go to the cross. When it hits your heart that that's what God has done for you, that's when it becomes your aim to please Him. That you realize that your greatest joy is to bring Him great joy. Working out your salvation will always be driven by a heartfelt, bone-deep, sincere, burning love for God. Because then you'll just want to please Him in everything. And sacrifices will be like, yeah, of course I'll sacrifice for God. God, I'll go wherever you send me. Anything is worth it. 
then you can lay yourself like, like, like Paul as a sacrificial offering of your faith, being poured out like a drink offering. Yes, absolutely, whatever it takes to create a pleasing aroma for my heavenly Father. And this ultimately brings us to a better life. Number four, a better life. Paul starts talking about his ministry colleagues. And here's, here, here's what I want you to picture. Paul is living in the Roman Empire. Picture the most lavish house, like the most lavish Roman house. Wealth, power, status, acclaim. But then listen to Paul's words where he says, I'm sending you Timothy, my fellow worker, like a son with a father who's going to look out for you in ways that nobody else will. Not only that, I'm going to send you Epaphroditus. You were concerned about him. He almost died in order for, for, the, for the mission of Jesus. I want to come to you also. I want to encourage you. And I want you to, to, to encourage one another. Now picture these as a contrast. Picture having this lavish Roman home with all the accoutrements and all the, the splendor and the pomp and circumstance, but no Christ Jesus. No fellowship. No salvation. And yet this man sitting in prison is thinking about what? He's thinking about the Philippians. He's figuring out how to send Timothy and Epaphroditus. Left to myself, that's not what I'm thinking about in prison. I'm stewing in self-pity. But when God empowers you by His Spirit to work out your salvation, it leads to a better life. Because even with imprisonment, even, even in suffering, even in difficulty, you are experiencing the salvation that God has given you by grace through Jesus Christ. It's a better life. It's a better life. Because here's why. You get all the accoutrements and the beauty and the splendor of the Roman household, but you don't get Jesus, you get nothing. In the end, you get nothing. But in this life, you get Jesus, even if it comes with suffering, and it does, you get everything. You get eternal salvation. You get eternal fellowship. You get brothers and sisters in Christ who circle around you, who, who become your spiritual family. You get people who will sit in prison and figure out how to send you somebody to encourage you. This is the better life. The taste of salvation that God has given you by grace in Jesus Christ. As we baptize people today, they're celebrating, and this is an image of the new life that they have been reborn into. It's new life. And it's not this ethereal, disembodied thing. No, it is new life in every respect, relationally. New, new, new inward motivations, the ability to look to the interests of others. It's completely new. And when you believe in Jesus, he gives you salvation, and then you get the opportunity to live it out for eternity. And the more you look to Christ, the more you'll love your Heavenly Father. And the more you love your Heavenly Father, the more you'll make it your aim to please him. The more you make it your aim to please him, the more you'll say, even if, even if it hurts even if it's uncomfortable, even if I have to sacrifice. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, there is no match for what you have done for us in Jesus. Nothing compares that you would send your only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. And then you give a newness of life that can stand up to suffering like nothing else can. God, we say thank you. We praise you. We thank you. We glorify you. And Lord, we take your word to heart. We want to lean in to this salvation that you have procured for us. We want to lean in so that we might lay, might lay hold of all that you have for us. God, we don't want to be apathetic. We don't want to be distant. We don't want to ignore the good gifts. We want to say yes and amen. It's in the name of Jesus that we do say yes and amen.